Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Notification. Great. So welcome to another uh, episode of Phoenix VR for Good. Uh, we have tried very with with varying success to hold one of these every month for the last four years. Um, the last year and a half has been a bit of a challenge. So my apologies if we've been a bit sporadic. Um, it took Austin stepping up and creating a presentation uh, for us here in December for us to re-engage. Um, what we try to do is we, we get members of the audience, you know, folks like yourselves uh, to contribute whatever it is that you're working on um, with the focus being on a for good slant. So it, it's rarely, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's rarely primarily focused on games and it's more about education and facilitation of education. Um, so today our presentation is gonna be an introduction to WebXR. Uh, our presenter, Austin Godber, has been dabbling in XR for the last few years, trying to get a broad understanding of immersive technologies. He currently builds distributed petabyte scale data systems on Kubernetes. In the past, he collaborated and operated cameras on NASA's Mir and MSL Mars rovers, wrangled virtual penguins for Jumpbox, and helped start a municipal <laughs> Wi-Fi company. Um, so without further ado, Austin, take it away. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Yeah, that's uh, good. That's that's my description of myself. So it's good. Uh, that's, that's that's pretty, pretty accurate. Um, yeah. So thank you all for coming. Uh, like you said, my name is Austin Godber. I uh, uh, have been. Oh, here's it. Okay, you got it. Thank you. Uh, this presentation is about WebXR. The description said it's it's going to be kind of a broad overview of the technologies, and uh, we're going to have a little bit of code. I'm going to show a little bit of code. I thought I was going to emphasize A-frame, but uh, 3JS, I kind of got distracted with that. So I think that ended up being a, a good choice. So there's a little bit of A-frame, a little bit of 3JS, but I'm not going to get too deep into the code. I'm just going to show you, like I, I, I thought at this point that just showing some code, just so you know it's accessible, what, what you get with it, what you can accomplish with how much code is always kind of a good starting point for for something like this um and i guess uh yeah i guess we can just oh i should also say <clears throat> i am not an expert at webxr uh, i i should actually ask is anyone actually like professionally doing web vr web xr ar stuff because you may know a heck of a lot more than me I've only dabbled and uh, my experience has been more broad than it has been deep. Uh, so if anyone has any feedback or input or questions, please feel free to correct any errors or mis, uh, misleading uh, info I provide, or uh, if you have any, any, anything that you wanna highlight, let me know. Uh, and I'll try to watch the chat and uh, yeah. All right, so uh, <clears throat> like I said, my name's Austin Godber. I'm on Twitter at Godber, right? You know, I've been on the internet a long time and I usually grab the handle Godber under most circumstances. You can find me on GitHub as Godber as well. Uh, I own the phoenixvr.org and the webvr.dev domains. Uh, which you'll see tie in here a little bit uh, in the in the future here, but uh, yeah, let's let's get, let's get going. So why why would we do the web? Obviously, there's a lot of there's at least several ways to to create a VR app. Hold on, I need to be able to see the Zoom window. Oh, it's up there. Okay. Um, yeah, so so why the web? You can you know you could build things in Unity, you could build build things in Unreal, uh, or the other the other standard game things, and ship an actual application to a device. But the web is also an option. And why why would I argue that you should use the web at all? I definitely wouldn't argue that you should use it for everything, but it's it might be more capable than you realize, and uh, and it might be a might be a good match for certain circumstances. Of course. Delivering things on the web is low friction. Everyone has a web browser. Most people have a web browser that can display XR content. If you have an Oculus Rift, Oculus Quest, you have the web 
uh, web XR capable browser. Um, <clears throat> on the web, most of the frameworks, sorry, hold on, I'm just kind of getting reoriented on my, uh, for Zoom here. Yeah, there we go, there we go. Now I can see people. Okay, hi Elliot, thank you. Okay, uh, so most of the, most of the web XR frameworks have a 2D fallback mode. So when you're developing an immersive solution, uh, you don't have to be developing explicitly for an XR platform. So you can develop one application that's viewable in an immersive XR VR headset, but for the people who don't have XR headsets, you could just look at the same thing in kind of, you know, a rendered 2D, 3D scene that you aren't inside, you're just viewing inside your browser window. So that can be a benefit. Distribution is easier. Obviously, you don't have to build, make builds and ship ship builds to customers that all kind of comes implicitly with how you deploy to the website um, source is easily shared and copied yeah so you can make that hard if you want to but one of the things i, I built my first website in 1994 um, and the way i did that was looking at the source of every other website that i found you right click say show source and uh, I learned everything that way. It just, you know, that, that's just kind of how, how I managed to grow and develop was by looking at, oh, hey, that's a cool feature that I'm looking at. How was that implemented? And with, um, with a, a traditional compiled app that just gets shipped as, you know, on Steam or something, you don't really get the opportunity to see how the sausage is made. So building things in the web is, uh, might make it easier, slightly easier to kind of see the, see how it was made. Uh, I also argue that the web eventually eats everything. Uh, you, as you guys, you know, we, we were building desktop apps 20 years ago, and now we've made, we've modified the, the web technologies to the point where we pretty much have desktops, desktop type applications and desktop type performance. It's never going to be quite as good. There's always going to be a limitation, but uh, inevitably the web expands. And even if the technology isn't sufficient today, it will it will eventually be sufficient for many use cases. But like I said, there's always going to be cases where that's not a great choice. Um, you know, high, there's absolutely going to be complexity, interaction complexity, and like model complexity, too many polygons, too big a textures. There are always going to be limitations. And the web, web XR stuff is going to um, uh, fumble earlier than, than you know, a compiled application, something made in C or something. Uh, but uh, still, you can probably get further than you, you might realize. You guys do see the presentation, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, and then the other reason is I already bought the web VR do dev domain. So, you know, I figured might as well uh try and do that uh, actually so my my purpose uh my purpose for 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 concentrating on web vr here in their web xr in the short term is i want to do a bunch of small experiments on how uh interaction experiments and usability and ui experiments and experiment with how immersive technologies are going to change the way we do things kind of in the longer term um, so I just want to be able to make, create, quickly create simple experiments and deliver those experiments to people who might be able to play with and provide feedback. Uh, and, and having to, you know, build, build a Unity app and ship that, make it APK, you know, get a certificate or I don't know, I, you know, that all gets complicated. It's very straightforward if you just send someone a URL and tell them to just hit the, hit the, hit the, and enter VR button in their, in their browser. So the outline for tonight's talk is um, we have kind of, I'm going to lay out the foundation of the WebXR technologies. And I really did kind of get bogged down in this section, <laughs> um, but hopefully hopefully you guys find it useful. I, I talk through some of the existing frameworks for developing uh, XR applications. 
And the frameworks uh, are, I'm gonna concentrate on the JavaScript HTML frameworks that, that, that exist. Uh, we'll see, I've implemented two very simple demos, uh, one in 3JS and one in A-Frame. Actually, I haven't implemented, I've taken them from their website and copied them into, onto my computer and I run them here. Um, but at, at least it'll give you uh, the opportunity to see what the code, it, it, the walkthroughs will be pretty quick and pretty painless. Uh, and you'll learn a little bit, I think. And then I'll discuss, I'll, I'll kind of wave my hands at some third party ecosystem stuff. And that is the things, um, the things on top of, built on top of the, the frameworks. There, uh, there is a lot of material out there. So A-Frame is built on top of 3JS. A-Frame just recently turned five years old. So there's a whole blooming ecosystem of A-Frame components out there that do a whole variety of things. And there's a whole bunch of things that you'll, you'll realize that, that uh, are possible. And then, and then maybe we'll have some time to go through some other examples. All right. So the foundation. There are really two enabling browser APIs uh, that form the foundation of any immersive web experience. And these are recently added APIs. Obviously, JavaScript and WASM both provide the, the foundation, like provide the executable code that you can write and deliver to customers or to users. Um, but the addition of Web, WebGL, which enables browser access to the GPU hardware. And it basically will do the video rendering of your objects onto your screen. And then the web XR, it enables browser access to HR hardware. So, you know, that's, that's telling you the position of your headset, the position of your hands and, and, and what buttons you're pressing. And, you know, what basically what the field of view is you're looking at that, that web XR <clears throat> API is, is, uh, uh, it enables the access to the XR hardware. And I, I have an illustration that, that hopefully kind of clarifies that. Uh, so, so basically, let's see, if I wave my cursor around, do you guys see the cursor? Okay. All right, so I've tried to illustrate the, the relationship to these technologies. And actually, I had a really useful conversation with the people in, uh, I, actually, I don't know what Discord, I think it's... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know which Discord, but there's a great Discord with a lot of immersive technology people in it. There's like channels for uh, web stuff, Unity, Unreal, and like all sorts of different things. Um, but I, I had a conversation with them. I, I, I had drawn a, a bad, a much worse version of this illustration here to try and explain to you guys the technologies that are involved. In fact, I complete the hysterical thing to me is that I completely omitted the XR hardware and XR APIs, uh, which is a little ironic because I was for whatever I was only thinking about WebGL, which was kind of funny. Uh, but basically, you know, your computer, your computer or your Oculus Rift for that matter, or Oculus Quest for that matter, has a it has a GPU, it has a an ARM processor and a GPU, but that GPU is you know allows you to do these fast parallel pipelines to render video or render video and images and things like that on, on a screen. And then, and then it has XR hardware that has, you know, like the accelerometer, it has, you know, whatever inside out tracking or the, any other tracking options. So your computer has these, these, these two sets of hardware. And then these, the web XR hardware API and the web GL hardware API are implemented inside your web browser. So your web browser here is Chrome or Oculus browser on the, on the Oculus Quest or Firefox reality. So your browser implements these API, these two APIs, and then these higher level things allow you to uh, interact with these APIs, which allow, or, do things with these APIs to interact with this hardware. So basically you can say using the web GPL, web GL, web GL API, you can say, hey, GPU, please draw a cube. And, or you can say, uh, when you click a button on your uh, controller, that will come back out, that event will pop up into your JavaScript application, and then you can handle that event. 
So on top of the browser, you have running inside the browser. So basically the blue box here is uh, code that you write or compile to. Uh, and that's the code that gets delivered via the web to the, to the browser. And e there's a number of frameworks and ways you can build a like deliverable website. So this, this talk is gonna talk mostly about the things up in this top left corner, the JavaScript frameworks which uh, we have 3JS is kind of the foundational, one of the original things, uh, one of the original JavaScript um, wrappers for WebGL. And, and now 3JS basically wraps the WebGL API, the WebXR API, and provides a bunch of handy functionality. And we'll get, we'll get into that a little bit more. And you can use web. Uh, you can use three JS directly to implement your 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 application, or there are things that are implemented on top of uh, higher level of abstractions on top of three JS. So there's something called R3F, which is React three fiber, and there, which is a really React like um, framework, but it does use three JS. It doesn't quite wrap it, but it uses it. A frame it does wrap 3JS. And the distinction there is just, there's just a small distinction in that um, the, uh, the way R, uh, R3F uses 3JS isn't sensitive to changes in the version of 3JS. So it's kind of interesting. Any, anytime 3JS releases an update, the A-frame guys have to go update their code to handle the new version of 3JS. That's the way R3F does it. You, they don't have to do that, which is kind of interesting. And I just, like, I think I learned that today. Um, so all this is fresh stuff for me. So there's a lot a lot of things I don't know. Babylon JS is another JavaScript framework that is independent of 3JS. It's got full, you know, AR, VR. Um, I think, actually, I don't know if it has AR capabilities, uh, but it does have VR capabilities, uh, does all the rendering, Interact, interact and provides a scene graph type thing. ARJS, uh, we'll also talk about a little bit in the future. Uh, you know, it provides kind of the see through um, overlay on the world around you type of, uh, you know, Snapchat lens type scenario where you might want to project something, project a stormtrooper into your office or something. Uh, so th those are the those are the Java, JavaScript frameworks. We'll discuss those more in a little bit more detail. Oh, and they're third party things built on top of this. All right. The other the other the other way that people seem to be doing this is uh, obviously Unity. The game engines they uh, they you go ahead and sit down and it's IDE. You learn how to create a project in the IDE, and you know you you can build scenes in there, or import things there. You can make all sorts of game stuff I don't I've never really used one I mean I've done a single demo with unity um I think I, it was a cube that I set on a pillar and I was able to pick it up with my hand and I thought that was pretty cool um but all of that you know you're, you're editing code inside that thing it's c sharp or javascript or something you could build a binary out of that or the other way that uh, if you use the web xr exporter I think it I think it makes its binary and then, and then uh, compiles that binary into WebAssembly. And then that WebAssembly can then run in your browser. I'm sure it does a lot more than that. Uh, I don't really understand it very well, but basically many of the game em engines have this kind of, you know, you work in the standard game engine IDE and then you just set up web as one of your build targets. So instead of building for, um, instead of building for Oculus Rift, you're building for the web, and then you drop a file on a website, maybe wrap it in some HTML, and then, and then you have a web executable type uh, application. So Unity, Godot, Unreal Engine, uh, like the, I didn't dig too deeply into it, but the one thing I did find, it, like they, they had pushed it out onto GitHub and said, oh, this is community support now, which I didn't understand what that implied, but those sorts of things always make me nervous. I did discover there's something called Wonderland Engine, and I think there are other things like it, but it's basically like a game editor, but I think it's only ever meant to build straight to WebAssembly. So instead of the web build being, you know, an equal or second class citizen as one of the build targets, uh, it's 
the Wonderland engine, as I understand it, is designed to uh, build only to WebAssembly or only, only for being deployed to the web. And if anyone has a better understanding of this, these, these are very peripheral understandings for me. Uh, let me know, give me a shout or something. Oh, there's people chatting. I don't know what they're saying. Are they correcting me? Oh yeah. No, you're good, you're good. Just give okay. me a little more background. Okay, yeah, cool. If anyone sees someone like, you know, asking for clarification or something, I, I don't, it's hard for me to catch that. Um, okay, so, so that's kind of, uh, this is kind of what the, you know, what the stack looks like. And this third party thing, there's a whole variety of completely abandoned minor projects to really fancy, you know, uh, well-implemented things that have existed for several years. Um, all right, so the Web a WebXR device API, it's an API for web content and apps to use it to interface with mixed reality hardware, such as VR headsets and glasses with integrated augment augmented reality features. So, uh, oh, by the way, this, this I'll, put, I'll put a link to this presentation up somewhere uh, so you, you all can access it. I need to get it onto the web first, but all this blue stuff is, these are links. I like hyperlinks. And actually this is one of my pet peeves about uh, WebXR right now is you can't follow a link in, a, in an immersive fashion very easily yet. And I like links, you don't have a web if you don't have a link, it's just a bunch of points that are not connected. Uh, so like that's, I don't know why that irritates me so much, but it does, so, uh, well, but they're working on it. Well, so can you jump back to the previous slide? Yep. So if, if I'm uh, uh, interested in developing immersive content, and I pick a framework like A-Frame that sits on top of 3JS. Do I need to know 3JS or is, is A-Frame completely encapsulating it for me? Um, you will almost certainly end up using some 3JS. Uh, um, <clears throat> it's, it's possible to build, in, in fact, the, the example I have is entirely a frame components, so you the, there uh, there is no. But I think the more complex your app gets, you end up needing to implement your own components in three JS and maybe some parts in three JS. And I I haven't I haven't used R three F yet, but in A frame you can just directly access the three JS um, global variable and start directly coding you know three JS code in your A frame application. It is possible to implement things in just a frame but i think you, i don't know how quickly you'll hit a wall because i don't understand the extent of the third part because the answer to that question depends on how the extent of the third party things well the things that are built in a frame the extent of the third party ecosystem because there are a lot of components that you could just throw into your app and all of a sudden be able to do stuff um but if you don't build um, any of your own custom stuff, it's probably gonna feel a lot like everybody else's apps. And I think people are probably gonna be wanna be distinguishing themselves. So I think most use cases, you'll probably be writing some 3JS. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good question though. Um, and that that's actually kind of, I started, so I've had several projects that I've started and still not completed, of course. Um, but I started something in A-Frame and then I kept having to break out and go into 3JS, but that's because I don't really know how to make an A-Frame component and extend it myself. And that would be useful to do, but I, they're both, they're both pretty neat. And they're, they're, I, I think, I think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm not, I won't dwell on it too much, but uh, yeah, I, I have a hard time understanding what's really, you know, like the most useful thing. So I, I don't, I don't have a good feel for, how you ought to do it necessarily. Um, okay, so this this is lifted straight from the Mozilla Developer Network uh, description of the WebXR API interface. Uh, so there's a spec. One thing I noted, and you'll see here, is that when I went to check for the browser support of the WebXR spec, the note on all of the browsers what was that this is a very broad and extensive spec. So basically every browser support was caveated by saying, 
this is a really big spec, so we've it's only been partially implemented in this browser. So uh, I don't really have a full understanding of what limitations would be present in each browser, but this is all fresh new stuff, which is what makes it, it exciting. They, there was actually, I should have mentioned, I, sh I didn't write this in the slide. There was a spec prior to this. I think it was just called the web VR spec or something like that. And then at some point they realized, well, hold on, we have this whole, we have these whole other hardware classes that we need to take into consideration. Uh, so they scrapped that and they're like, okay, well, let's, let's, let's do something broader here. Uh, but you can go check the spec out there and, and the MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network, which is a good resource for anyone doing any web development, uh, has docs on the WebXR API. And so it, this, so because it's, you know, because we're talking about developing on the web, you have to ask the question, what browsers support the things that I'm going to use? So WebXR is the newer of the two APIs. So WebGL is several is several years older, as like probably WebGL v1 is probably like seven or eight years older. I don't really know. Um, WebXR is maybe two three years old. Um, so the WebXR hardware API is impl implemented at least partially in the main desktop browsers, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, but in some cases that's locked behind feature flags, you know, you have, might have to go to about Chrome to enable something or actually I think Chrome is fine. I think it's like Firefox and Safari. Safari and uh, in both Mac OS and iOS seem to be lagging in the implementation of these things. Um, I saw lots of cautions about that just for WebXR. And then on, on the Oculus, uh, Oculus Quest, there's, you, you basically have two options. You have the Oculus browser and the Fire, Firefox reality browsers. Uh, those, those both implemented at least partially. Austin, as you were working on, on the demonstration and, and doing your research, was there a browser that you were more comfortable using in the expectation that it would be more compatible? The, uh, every, the, the, the two simple demos that I have implemented here, I tested on the Oculus Quest in both Oculus browser and the Firefox reality. So beyond that, I don't, I don't have any answers. I've, since I've moved, I've been too lazy to put up my lighthouses. So I don't even have any of my desktop stuff running. Uh, I guess I could put up my Rift S. Uh, yeah, so uh, the story is a little different for WebGL. Like I said, it's much older. Uh, so there was a V1. In two, oh, in 2011. So the, the V1 WebGL API is 10 years old. So that's, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty well established. And the V2 API only extends GL. It doesn't, I don't think it deprecates anything. So there's, those are both very well supported uh, across browsers. And I've got links here to, uh, oh, and if, if you're the kind of person, I'm not, yeah, oh, I should have also, the other caveat about this, not only am I not a web XR, web VR developer. I'm not even a graphics developer. I really, like, so if I say things that like, if I misuse the word shader or something, don't be surprised. I mean, I, I, I roughly have a sh an idea what a shader is. I've written the hello world. Happy to, I'll be happy to pipe in and correct you. Yeah, Go please ahead. don't, please don't let me mislead <laughs> anyone terribly. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so all, 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 all sensible modern browsers support WebGL2 and GL1 at this point. Oh yeah, the thing I was gonna say is uh, the V1 implements a specific open GL um, spec and then V2 of WebGL implements open GL ES3. So if that means anyone, uh, neither of these, uh, neither of these things mean anything to me. So like, it doesn't do any good for me to know that information, but maybe your brain knows it. Uh, okay. So, oh yeah. And then you can test your browser here if you'd like, if you want to find out whether your browser does. Lori had a quick question, which was, does every browser that supports WebXR support WebGL? Like this, is WebGL the base or are they separate things? Well, they're, they're definitely separate APIs. This is something that's important to understand. They're separate things. The one, one, and that, and that's that's really the realization that I that I had when I was making this diagram is in my mind I had lumped kind of like all of this stuff together. But these are these are 
these are interfaces that were developed independently in your browser that your program can use. So the WebGL and the web, that's, and that's what I'm trying to show here is these things are not even related. Um, the VR headsets, you know, they have both of these pieces of hardware, the GPU, the XR hardware, but they're not, you know, there's, they're different components inside the, the computer inside your quest, right? So the, I do believe that the, the, the browsers that implement WebXR also implement WebGL, but that's because WebGL is far more, you know, just older and better, you know, it's been, well, so <clears throat> here's, here's something I also failed to kind of call out at, at so 3JS, so 3JS is widely used uh, on the internet for non-immersive things. Uh, you will see like car companies and basically lots of advertising firms use, you know, flat display 3D graphics to kind of liven up their websites or sell their cars or like maybe fly arounds in a car might be implemented using a model using 3JS. I mean, you don't, you don't hit the enter VR button to like, you know, enter the immersive experience. You, you, you still only look at, so 3JS is very widely used um, in to, to render 3D stuff on a 2D screen. And, and that wouldn't you so those those use cases wouldn't wouldn't be using the WebXR APIs, if that makes sense. It 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 really I had an aha moment when talking to the to the guys in the the immersive XR the WebXR whatever the Discord was when I'm like wait I don't understand why are you saying like because the guy the guy was telling me and, I, and this is actually a pretty sweet Discord because they're like there's guys who are like. Uh, they are developers on the Oculus browser and you know, Fire. And I don't think Firefox, but yeah, the Oculus browser and Samsung. So like some of these folks, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've seen your commit messages on like, you know, like you clearly know better than me. You're trying to tell me that the XR hardware needs to be down below there next to the GPU. And I'm like, oh wait, I get it. I get it now. It, it was hard for me to, it took me a while. I'm sorry. I'd, Okay. Anyways, <clears throat> sometimes these things. No, that's happen. cool. Don't apologize. <laughs> no, it's like I, I had an aha moment. Okay. So yeah, iOS and macOS were a little behind the curve, but they do, they do, they do support uh, the WebGL stuff. They have for a, a. In fact, I think when I wrote this slide, I was confused, still confused, the difference between WebGL and WebXR. So I think I think this slide is pretty much incorrect. I mean, that might have been slower. That's I probably changed my language to be a little less concrete as, a, as an out. Uh, okay, so now this is worth noting. And um, if you are really into programming GPUs and you already know GLSL, uh, the, the GPU shader language, you can directly write the C, C, C style GLSL language wrap it in JavaScript and send it directly to the browser using the WebGL API. So that's, <clears throat> you can down in the, down in the, um, so basically you don't need to use any of these things. You can just have a little bit of JavaScript that calls a WebGL API and says, oh, here, send, send this shader, sh send this shader to program to the GPU. Now this is not, easy or convenient programming <laughs> uh, because it doesn't have, it, it only talks about, you, you know, you, it only deals with um, very low level graphics primitives. It doesn't have any concept of a mesh or, a, you know, there's no object, you know, there's no object things, but you, there, I, I don't know much about there it. Polygons but, on the screen at that point. It's very, yeah, it's some it, it, polygons. You man, manipulate polygons on the screen. It doesn't have any higher level concepts, so it's not a convenient way to work. Oh, actually, that reminds me, Lori, of the tweet, uh, the tweet, your tweet today, uh, which I didn't know the answer to. Which is uh, what? What exactly was it? Do you recall it? <laughs> How would answer. you make a a 
dense fog that is. That's it. Um, uh, so a frame has like, you know. a, a fog entity. So, I mean, obviously you're not going the a frame route. So I don't know the answer to your question because your question is about unity. Uh, but like a, if the fog is implemented as a shader and, and, and unity is smart about like, it's like, oh, here's my, here's my, here's my GPU program. It, 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 it probably just says, oh yeah, well here we just wrap this in a little bit of JavaScript and it'll just work the way. I, I don't, I don't really know, but you can one a frame has a shade a fog has fog functionality and probably three js as well i don't i'm almost certain yeah. um, yes, i found some tutorials explaining how to do it in pure you know three js yeah but not unity yet yeah. still looking for that yeah i'm not yeah i'm not i don't know yeah i don't i'm pretty sure an a frame fog is just like an option you set on an HTML entity, which is like kind of mind blowing. It's so high level, it's totally cool. Um, but like you can just, you can just send GPU programs directly to the GPU through, through the, through the WebG, uh, WebGL API. Um, but it's, it's really low level. So it's, it's a pain to work with. It would be for me, uh, but, if you want to do that route, this is what you these these things. If you want to see how fun it is, you can go to webgl2fundamentals.org, and it will show you that you basically just write a simple JavaScript function. You make a string, and then inside that string, there's your shader code, your C like your C like shader code, and uh, and then it it gets gnarlier there. All right, so that's that's kind of the foundation. That's the uh, that's the foundation of what everything's built on. It kind of gives you an idea of where we're headed. And uh, now let's let's talk about the frameworks here. So your options for building an immersive experience on the web include the direct WebGL implementation. Like you can just go ahead and write your shaders. You can use a WebXR framework. You can use one of these uh, game engines. And you know I. I, I don't know, I, I, I said this, I don't know how true it is because I don't have a good feeling. Like I, I feel like the game engine guys, I don't know how seriously they take the WebXR build platforms. So I don't know how hard it is. I, but I have a hard time believing that that statement's probably too cavalier. It's probably less true that they probably because the web is you know everyone knows the web's a big deal right, uh, but I, I don't know I, I think I typed that when that when I saw the Unreal Engine said oh yeah our exporter is now in community support and like it wasn't clear whether it was being deprecated or what maybe they're replacing it with something or I more likely is I just I have something way better that I'm completely unaware of that seems very likely. No, that that seems true in my experience, um, although Unity seems to offer the most support for WebGL of the game engines that I'm familiar with. Now, the, uh, are there multiple things that will export from Unity to WebGL or is it a built-in primary piece of functionality or is it th something you get out of the store? Or? The second thing you said, it's built in a one primary export to WebGL. Okay, okay. Um, there's like, you have to add in packages for web XR so sure. that you can get controller support and sure. that kind of thing. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I know we've kind of been through all this. Okay, so we're going to concentrate on the JavaScript and HTML frameworks. So we're, we're talking about this top left corner here. All right, so we've got these, we've got 3JS, we've got A-Frame and React 3, Fiber built on top of 3JS, we have Babylon and ARJS, and there are likely many more and including commercial options. There's a whole variety of, of, of options here. I kind of excluded anything that was like $6,000 a year. And I, you know, uh, I figured you know, if we're talking about, uh, you, you guys can find those things if, you, if, you're, if you're into that, uh, yeah. So let's start with 3JS. So it's a uh, scene graph based. So very similar to, you know, any, like anything you might, you, an inter there, 
the objects in, in your application are organized similar to how things would be organized in Blender or in Unity. You have a scene graph uh, and, well, let's see, we'll, yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, so the, here's, some, here's just some references. The, their main website is 3js.org. Here's some docs. Uh, they have a great list of examples and all the code of the examples are up on GitHub. <coughs> Excuse me. The fundamentals link here on the 3JS. This is just on the 3JS page in the manual, a section of the manual. This is where you, you I would start if you want to check it out. I mean, go look at these things. And then when you really want to start trying to implement something, start the fundamentals and think about that. That's that's kind of, that's good. Or play with the examples. It's it, their doc, Their documentation is really good. Uh, so what I was trying to get at, and I didn't want to verbally describe it without showing you the, you know, it kind of has this scene graph organization. You have a scene object, and in that scene, you have uh, a variety of meshes, some 3D objects, groups of mes meshes and objects. You have lights, you have a camera, and there's a renderer. Uh, the renderer is responsible for keeping track of all these, or well, displaying all these things in, 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 uh, in your, whatever your display is. Um, and, you know, meshes have uh, both geometry and materials. Some materials are just like colors and some materials have, you know, a texture image or something applied to them. And that's, you know, that's, that's basically, that's basically, that's a pretty common thing, right? I mean, I, I open up Blender and I see that sort of structure and I open up Unity and I kind of see, and then I close Unity and then, I don't know. I'm usually just, I'm usually in the properties setting a uh, properties dialogue in, in unity where I'm just trying to figure out how to make something work because that's a, usually as far as I ever get with that thing. Uh, so, okay, so now let's talk about the a 3JS example here. So being the web, you're gonna have a web, uh, uh, you know, an HTML file. So is this text legible to everybody? Yeah, okay. So it's, it's you know, it's very straightforward, you know, none of this, these things are, yeah, I don't know that these are even necessary. The margin zero is important because without margin zero, you're going to have a very tiny little, uh, you're going to have a tiny little border around your 3JS app because there's always a default margin when you have one thing inside of another thing in, um, in HTML. You got that margin zero gets rid of that border and makes the app go all the way out to the, um, edge. So there's just that little style setting, then you need to import the three JS source. And then this, uh, uh, this is just, I, I just copied the minified version of three JS to my local machine You get this off of GitHub, or you can NPM install it. They, they have, there's multiple options in the, depending on your work, your build and deploy workflow, you know, you have uh, multiple options on how you would do this. Uh, same is true for all the other things that we talk about here and the things in, and probably even the things we don't talk about. But, you know, the easiest thing is to just grab the minified JavaScript source code and import that as a script. And then, so I write the, the program I write here is going to be in the main JS file. And I import that, I, I, I set the type here to module, which means that inside this main JS file, I can import other things. Otherwise, I think I'd have to import them up here. Uh, or maybe even some things wouldn't work. I don't know. I, like the whole JavaScript packaging world is still embarrassingly uh, a bit of a mystery to me. I never really do the front end JavaScript stuff. I've only really done no no JS. I'm a weird JavaScript developer. I've done JavaScript for five years. And I, this is like the first web app I've made. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's see. I think. Just a couple of pages here. Okay, so in this main JS file, so this is the thing that I imported in into the HTML file. It's it's pretty straightforward here. This is just basically loading a, a library. This is the VR button, and that adds some. Uh, you'll you'll see we use that down here to render a button inside the 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 window. Uh, so basically, we set up a scene. So this three here, this is in scope because we included it in the HTML file. This creates a, a three scene object. 
Then we create a camera object and a perspective camera object. And I think you always need to use a perspective camera object for VR stuff, uh, for immersive stuff. Otherwise, because there are other camera objects that I don't think will, I don't either, I don't know if it won't work or it won't look right. Uh, I don't, haven't tried. I don't know which the story is, but. Um, so there's just a little bit, it's kind of setting up this camera, some defaults on the camera. We create a renderer and this, so this creates the WebGL renderer. And let's see, so we set the size to the renderer to the window size. And then we attach, so this is, this is the kind of JavaScript that I've never done, but I, I get it. So this is kind of the built-in browser stuff. So the each page, there's like a global in each page called a document. That document has a body. You want to append to that doc that body. This DOM element, this renderer, the DOM element for the renderer. So basically, you're just attaching the renderer to the body thing that you set up in the HTML. And then we're doing another one where we attach this VR button, and this VR button is a button you end up clicking in the in the browser in order to begin your immersive session. And then <clears throat> this is where all the magic happens. So without this, you would, you would only be using the WebGL APIs with, when you turn on the XR renderer, then that enables, that, that enables all of the, this just magically turns on all of the render to stereo rendering position information and all that stuff happens magically as managed by the browser for you. So the, then, then we set, we define it a box. We create a box just, there's this, this uh, global function called box geometry that spits out a box when you call it and the, oh no, actually it's class, my bad. Uh, so we make a new instance of this box geometry class, and then we make a material, and then we make a mesh from that geometry and that material, and then we call that cube, and then we take that cube and we add it to the scene, and up above, you may remember we created the scene object. So then we set the camera position up above, also we set the, created the camera. Um, and then we animate. So basically, if we didn't want to animate anything, we would have just called uh, renderer dot render scene and camera, and that would have just given us the static, um, the the static scene with the camera in one position, and the the cube would just be sitting there. And so that's not super exciting, but. It uh, so to make it a little more exciting, you you can call this animate function, and this set animation loop is uh, this is slightly so the way you do this with XR capabilities is this is the way you do it if you want to do make an XR app. You do it slightly differently if you were just making a two D you know in a window app. You wouldn't use this set animation loop. Um, but basically, this animation function gets called periodically, and uh, and on every call, it will rotate the cube a little bit. And so, if you're looking down at it, it will, you know, you'll see here the camera position happens to be above the cube. Um, well, actually, you won't see because that's only apparent <laughs> when you put a VR headset on, uh, which I don't think I can demo for you. I, yeah, that's a, I hadn't thought about that. I wonder how I could demo that. I don't know. Do you do that all the, all, all the time, Dennis? Dennis, I don't even, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, there's quite a bit of prep to demo in VR while you're yeah. doing the video. Yeah, it's, it's complicated, but it's okay. Like as long as we get to see it in 3D. Yeah. It, di it didn't even occur to me until just now that like, oh yeah, like I can't even show you what, like I can show you me looking at it, but that's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So, you know, if I reload this, you, okay, there you go. <clears throat> so this is what you end up with. Uh, because of the material that I, uh, that I selected for this, uh, there's no lighting, there's no, so it's just a, there's no sense of depth, but if I, I didn't, I, I debated whether I should add that stuff, but I thought it might, 
serve as a good exercise for anyone who wanted to try this. There's basically like a four line change you can make this. You have to add a light. I was gonna do it, but then I realized, oh, I have to add a light too, because there's no light right now. This is just a green cube and that green, there's no you know, light reflecting off of it at you or anything. It's just green, bright, emissive surface. So uh, I didn't wanna complicate the example by, by extending it. But basically if, if um, so VR is not supported. Okay, so first off right now, we are only, this demo here running in this browser is only using the WebGL, only using the WebGL API. It's rendering a 3D cube that's using my GPU to render that 3D cube. The WebXR API is probably not being used beyond testing whether or not the browser supports XR. And the reason the browser doesn't support XR is this is my Mac and I don't have any XR hardware attached to it. So if you loaded this into your Oculus Quest or you know whatever, whatever headset you have with a browser that supports it, uh, then you would have a button here. And this button you could click and uh, depending on the browser, it might warn you, it might say, oh, you've clicked on a link and the browser, the website is now asking your permission to enter um, an immersive uh, an immersive session. And they do this so that you have control over how this happens. You wouldn't want to be transitioned into something you don't like, right? So uh, this browser doesn't, uh, well, the browser does it, no hardware. The, um, yeah, so now if you were to hit this, you would you would go into into this space and you'd look around. You wouldn't see anything until you looked down because I didn't bother to really move where the camera was by default relative to the thing. So the cube is floating below you, uh, but you'll see it. And you know you you you'd look around. You'd have an immersive thing. So I th that's this is the appeal to me. Like uh, I I still keep failing to get over the unity like project setup hump because I keep like getting new headsets and like each like to build do a new thing. It's like having to go find a new build target or something, or maybe I'm, maybe, maybe I'm just not patient enough. And I don't know, but like, there's like 20 lines of code and you could already be kind of like in a thing. Right. And you could, someone else could look at it too. Right. You could just put copy two files to your computer, three files to your web server. And then, and then everything's, Everything good from there. Okay, so I've talked a lot. We could go on to the next thing. We, we, we'll, we'll go on to the next thing, but I wanna take a breath. And does anyone have any thoughts or questions or? Yeah, so Laurie, you had a question concerning the light. Yeah, I just wondered if it was the same process as adding in the camera, you just like similar lines of code that dictate where it's at in the scene and then it works or yeah. Do you have to like write a light somehow. What what was uh, you do you have to what a light? <laughs> code a light. No, no, there's just light. a light object. There's just it's gonna be very similar to the camera. Okay. Yeah, that you're was just, you're just gonna you're just gonna create an instance of a light object. You're gonna put it, give it a location. Uh there's probably color. Um parameters for the light. Yeah, there's there's parameters when you create the light. I don't know what they are because of probably never done one. <laughs> I've probably done one using the defaults. Um, yeah. So that, that's, that's what happened. This, that's, that was another one of the aha moments is like, you're like, you create this thing and you're like, you know what? I know what's wrong here. I can't uh, like, so what happens? What happens if you just change the material? So this mesh, mesh basic material, it, it doesn't interact with light at all. Right, it's emissive. It just emits kind of the the color. Uh, if you just change the material, which is just just changing this thing, I think you change it to like mesh fong something. Um, I don't know what that. You know, it's like some. This is the one that interacts with light. But once you change that and you you go look at it in VR, you see nothing because everything's black because there's no light. So there's <laughs> there's no. And then you're like, wait, what's wrong? And then, so I started, I started going to change this. I'm like, oh, I need to change the material. I'm like, oh wait, I need to add a light too. And I'm like, it's not gonna fit in my boxes anymore on the, on the presentation. So it's just not, 
we'll, we'll leave it as an exercise to the reader. Okay. And the, the camera by default is controllable through the headset. Like you, you're just setting the initial vector for where you're, where it's looking and that's, that's, vector, a, good, that's a good that's a good question. So uh, this camera here and the, what what you're going to get with this particular code is you are going to be able to change uh, only the three degrees of freedom. Or actually, well, hold on. You can rotate too. You can you can look up, down, left, right, rotate. So you can only change. You can uh, you'd have to you'd have to add a little more. To the, I think it's the orbit controls. Actually, I don't know if the orbit controls are used for VR or. Uh, but with just a little bit more code, you can move around inside the. But with what I have here, you can only change your field of view, the camera's field of view. So okay. Okay. And and there's no interactivity. There's no physics going on here. You can't interact with the object. You can just look down and see this green floating blob. Um, that's just with this demo. There are options for interacting. Like there's the whole third. There's built in. I'm sure there's built in stuff. And I'm sure there's. Uh, well, I, hard to say where the line between where specifically for three JS where where it stops doing things and says, oh, this needs to be a third party thing. I don't know what they consider to be their core. Um, but there are absolutely physics tools. And we'll talk about these. I mean, I'll at least mention them later, tell you their names later for interacting with objects. And, you know, <clears throat> but like you, you can have your controllers in here and you can, you know, see your hands moving around, but just not in this demo, just due to the brevity. Okay, so there's, there's that super awesome, amazing green cube. Uh, any, anything else? Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's talk about a frame. So that was three JS. That was you know kind of the base, the kind of one of the earlier original guys, uh, our original uh, uh, three uh, JavaScript implementation frameworks. Uh, and now, so a, a frame came along a little later. It's implemented on top of that, and so it's it's higher level. It's not just a scene, and like they say here, A-Frame is not just a 3D scene graph or markup language. The core is a powerful entity component framework, which I don't understand really what that is. I have vague notions, but I don't. Is that totally something you understand, Laurie? Do you guys know? No. No, I was like, do you know what that is? No, I, don't <laughs> I have no idea what that I, is. I, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, no, I don't know. Um, it provides a declarative, extensible, extensible and composable structure to 3JS. So, uh, you can build components that are reusable inside, you know, uh, the same thing is true. The same thing is true for 3JS. You can build things, but not quite components. You'll see that the, the it, this is so high level that you just, you actually can implement things that you just write HTML, drop, you know, do write HTML and get, and get a scene. And that's kind of the remarkable thing. I'm sure the React thing, because the R3, R3, uh, React 3 Fiber has, you know, it's also a com has concept of components. I don't know React either. Uh, now I get it. Kevin's explaining that it's, you know, similar to how Unity, which you've already said you're not familiar with, but <laughs> allows you to right. add components to objects. So that makes sense. Okay. Cool. Uh, Components to objects, interesting. Okay, so I, you know, I've got some links to the references for A-Frame here. Their website is aframe.io. They've got docs. There's an A-Frame school, which is like it's a glitch. I'm sorry, glitch is not an accident. It's a website. <laughs> it's like a 3D playground website kind of thing. Uh, actually, the school is a uh, a reveal JS presentation like this, but then it links to a bunch of examples in Glitch, which is like a, a web web XR web VR kind of playground. So you know, like there's you have JavaScript web based JavaScript IDEs that have like a editor, and then it shows your thing here, and you type there, and it changes in the little box there. This is the same thing, but designed for web web GL and web VR stuff. When you say Glitch, you mean uh, is that Glitch.io? Is it Glitch.com? I don't remember. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that thing. Glitch dot. It's, it's not a. It's, it's it? not a mistake. It's like. It's not a mistake. A, it's a thing. 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, we can look at we can look at all these things. If you know, I'll be happy to go through some example. You know, look at some demo. Look at some examples with you guys. And, um, oh, and then they, they have a component registry, so like that you can go look at go see the what the community has made, and uh, there's all sorts of, and that's just a frame dot io slash a frame dash registry. Uh, so there's a bunch of reusable components there. Oh, get your glasses on. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. So let's see. And now th this is the amazing thing here is this is the extent of the, 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 there's no, there's no animation in this. Oh yeah. There is no animation in this one, but this is the extent of it. And I had a hard time squeezing it in here, unfortunately. So basically it's just some HTML. We load the A-frame min, the minified A-frame JavaScript. We create the standard HTML body. And now this kind of, uh, uh, we end up, this is where we kind of switch to the A-frame entities. So each one of these HTML tags is actually something that gets interpreted by the A-frame JavaScript. And so this creates a screen. This will create a box with this position and rotation and color. On the in the scene, and then we create a sphere. Same deal. We create a cylinder. Same deal. I tried to wrap these kind of a little bit, and then a plane, and then this sets a, a builds a skybox around you know around the center of the scene, and then that gives us this. So just in that tiny bit of HTML or HTML like code, so this would just be your index.html, you have this whole interactive. And now A-frame, A-frame, since it's a little higher level, it automatically includes, you'll, you'll notice that we didn't have to render the XR, uh, we didn't have to enable the XR renderer, we didn't tell it, that's, that's assumed. Uh, in fact, ah, can you guys still see that? Doesn't work, doesn't make a difference. Yeah, we can see it. Uh, but this is the little VR button. It displays that regardless of whether or not you have the XR, uh, any XR hardware. It, it just basically goes to full screen. Um, so yeah, and, but it also includes kind of the 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 key uh, the keyboard based movement. And let's see. So with with a mouse and the keyboard, we can kind of move around and you know check things out. Uh, it doesn't include any interaction stuff by default. Um, but here, so there, here's the, here's one of the cool things. And this is the thing that really caught my eye about A-Frame is because they kind of like, they're philosophically, like they want to share, they want people to be able to look at people's VR, uh, you know, code. And uh, every A-Frame includes in every, Thing by default, I don't know if it can be disabled, but if you hit uh, Control Option I, it will open the scene editor, the built-in web-based scene editor. And you, can you guys see this? Yeah. Did it show up? Okay. Uh, so you could, you know, go, you know, enable items, go edit the edit the parameters on these things. Um, Right, for those more familiar with Unity or with uh, any kind of editor, right, Blender, that kind of thing, you suddenly have an interface that allows for real-time feedback. Yeah. Yep. And so, no, okay, I'm sorry, it, I should, I'm, I was thinking to myself, it goes without saying, but no, it doesn't, since really I'm, I'm trying to say things. Uh, the, uh, the, all of these, uh, you know, these are the primitives that you can build with code these objects with, but you can, all of these have like importers. So if you want a GLTF or you want a whatever, whatever 3D model format you have, you just like put that model on the web and then you say load GLTF and it will load it into the scene. You give it a position and an orientation and stuff like that. So obviously, obviously this, the, you, you, no one should take no one should think that, oh, I have to, you know, make all of my, I have to do all of my modeling in this. You don't have to do that. You should do your modeling in whatever you're best, whatever you're best at, make that model, make sure, you know, 
don't make it too crazy because the, 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 you're gonna, this, this is a far more constrained environment than, than uh, you know, outside of the browser. Uh, so, you know, just going to want to be conscious about your texture sizes and the number of polygons and things like that, but you're probably already obsessed with those sorts of things anyways. Um, just dial it back a little bit if you want to put it on the web. Uh, but still, you can go, you, you can go look at all the little pieces and, and, you know, you can inspect, turn things off, add things. Oh, yeah, here, look, I mean, I can, oh, no, I just downloaded the whole thing as a GLB, I guess. Interesting. Okay, I don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing. This is the great thing about giving a presentation. You get to learn so much during the presentation. Now you can open that in Blender. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Uh, oh, actually, let's do it. Here, let's see what happens. This is where everything goes wrong. Uh, now, uh, I guess I have to open that. I led you astray. <laughs> OK. Yeah, we won't do that. You guys don't want to watch me do that. OK. Uh, yeah, all right. So, yep, there's that. So that's like the astonishing thing is how high level this is, right? So you can basically write your own uh, components or own en entities. Uh, so you could have your own little tags here. That's like, you know, you want to make a dog. You can say, you know, a dash dog and it makes a dog or something or all sorts of things. I like complex interactions or wheels put together in a car. I, I don't know, I have to, whatever. Got no idea. Okay. Did you find whether, I mean, I know that you were doing a fairly simple demo, but you were probably playing around with some A-frame stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you find that the quest had any kind of limitations at any point? Was there like a demo that you were like, okay, this is really not going to run? Did you run into that at all? Uh, I did not. I had a lot of that problem with the code I was writing. <laughs> Um, but no, the, I, I didn't know, uh, I, and in following, so the interesting thing about like, I'll, I'll talk about that discord again, because like there, well, I've been lurking in several discords, so I've seen a lot of interesting things like a frame often has problems with their examples stopping working because they've, uh, you know, maybe they don't test them sufficiently. Uh, with newer versions of browsers and things like that. Uh, I think A-Frame's getting a little stale. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think it's that, like two, two main people supporting it right now, right? Yeah, like, there's, two, there's two main people and it, it doesn't, yeah, yeah. There, there's two main people and it's not clear what they're up to right now. Mm -hmm. um, they, they clearly have something going on, but like, I think they're not investing the same quantity of time in A-Frame that they had been. Uh, and it and they don't have a large community support necessarily. Uh, it's not clear. Um, and you know, I don't mean. And there has been questions in the Discord specifically about a frame and how you know I, is it, you know, is it is it is it okay? And yeah, I, 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 I it'll probably be fine in the long run. Um, I don't I don't I don't really know though. I, I don't have I don't have longevity concerns for any of my projects, so I I don't I don't need to evaluate that. Yeah, it's, a, it's an emerging space, right? It's likely we're going to see tools come and go. And yeah. an open source project like this could thrive. Someone else could pick it up or it could die. Yeah. Right. I, I was going to add just like as a business owner, I had to make a call about two years ago whether to use A frame or, or WebXR pay, based frameworks or a compiled application like Unity. And it, and it was gut wrenching because once you make that business decision, you're going down a path that you're not going to turn around from for, for a very long time. Yeah. And so I, I made the call at that time to go Unity with some backup in mind on the on the WebXR side. Sure. Um, but I'm glad that I did because I was able to get far more done, at least to get to an MVP yeah. with Unity than I was with A-Frame at the time. Although some of those gaps were closed over time and there are now other frameworks for AR that can be rolled into in 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 addition to a frame. Yeah. Um, for, for anybody thinking about it in, in terms of the long term, like I, I wrote a little analogy there, which which it felt those of you that remember kind of the web appearing um, prior to HTML5 and CSS 3.0, the web was fairly ugly. I mean, like by today's standards, and it was not very interactive. And it wasn't until there was some standardization. And I remember there was a cover of some magazine, I don't know what it was, but it was like proclaiming like 
the, the, the new internet because CSS3 was now going to be standardized across all browsers. And that's like, that's old news now. And so yeah. as you were speaking, Austin, about kind of the, the genesis of this stuff, it feels a lot like that right now. Like, like we're not yeah. even at CSS1 yet. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, I, I think, I think 3JS is definitely solid. Like the, the, it's very foundational. It's very broadly used. I think, I, I don't know the extent I really, I, I don't understand the ecosystem well enough to really make judgment calls other than, other than that. I, because the three, the three JS guys, I think they're doing monthly releases and it seems to be. That's quite, I mean, relatively speaking, right. To creating a whole experience. That's very low level stuff. though. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's uh, yeah it's and I, that's kind of what makes it exciting to me too. And I, you know, if I had um, if I had a business use case, or if I had a a use case other, other than just novel horsing around like I'm doing, I you know I could have easily come to the same conclusion. That's like, uh, but like I've not one I've not managed to invest that initial hump of getting over the 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 unity ide learning the ide mm -hmm. uh hump so and i've never been i i'm a weird person i've never been an ide person right like i've always used like vi or like like bare bones kind of like i do now use vs code but they kind of like snuck all those fancy features in without getting in my way which was which was great uh but uh yeah i don't know like I can't watch two hours of YouTube just to figure out how to configure a project, right? It's like it's killing me. I don't know. They, it's it has gotten a lot easier. The friction is starting to go away as they standardize around the build types. Yeah. Um, it also the, the other thing is that there's also the analogy again of early web and Unity really being kind of like Flash, you know, like yeah, you know, and everybody was deep in Flash and all your money was on Flash because that's the tool that you had. Yep. And I remember there was a time when 3D was being done in Flash and people were so happy that you could do some physics in there. And then that was basically blown away as, as, as soon as the JavaScript frameworks started to mature. Yeah, and it, yeah, HTML5 and CSS3, all the, you can move things around on screen without, yeah. Um, do you have a recommendation as to like, you know, you, you started playing around with A-Frame is there any guidance around like what project maybe to look at first or something that helped you like, oh, okay, great. Like I get it now that I'm looking at this. Was there anything like that? Or was, was it primarily the community telling you here's where to start? Oh, uh, well, the resources that I've linked to are good and reading, checking out the, getting the code for the examples. There's an examples directory in both A-Frame and 3JS. I spent a lot of time looking at those and that's really the way to do it. Just like tweak a thing and then, I'll leave that, that was the way for me. And I, so I have one project that I'd love to talk about again in the future at some point, once I make a little progress on it, um, that I've been trying to, I've got a bunch of notional projects. I have one specific project that I have been trying to implement. And I spent two weeks trying to implement it one way and it didn't work out. And then I think I realized it was the wrong way. And I've got to, got to I think I've got, I know the right way now. I just started working on this presentation and haven't gotten back to implementing it in the new way. So um hopefully i'll have something kind of interesting to look at in the future um we just got a few more slides here let me let me get through these and then we can chat about stuff or Sweet. thank you yeah you bet um actually are is there any other questions because we will I, I really the 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 quantity of information declines rapidly in this presentation <laughs> we've kind of passed the point of no return where it's almost over okay all right so there's there's that guy uh, and, and remember that was uh, control option I in order to on any A frame page to open the import uh, the the inspector, the scene inspector control option I. All right, so there's also React three fiber. So if you like, if you know what React is and you use React, you're going to be like, hey, this is the thing I'm going to use. That's what will determine that. And it might even be the thing to use. It looks pretty sweet. Um, it you know it's it's built on top of three JS. Uh, it has self-contained components that can react to the state, and it's uh, you know you can utilize all of the existing React stuff, and uh, yeah, it's pretty slick. I I I I have only read the code. I've not tried to make anything with it yet. Uh, yep, yeah, got some examples here. 
I tried to find like kind of the best. Oh, look, look here. I didn't even finish editing this. This is a cut and paste error. Uh, this is from the A frame. <laughs> uh, but I did, okay, these, this, I'll fix this before I get it up. Oh yeah, I've got two. I've got two cut and paste errors. These, these last slides were done right before here. Uh, okay, so I don't know much about React 3J, React 3F as it turns out. I did want to at least mention the other frameworks. There's Babylon JS. That's a pretty comprehensive. I, I played with this actually for two or for about two weeks, just kind of like going through some of their examples and going through excellent documentation, like both uh, like uh, 3JS and A frame. The documentation is good. It, the organization of the documentation is slightly confusing, but there's a lot of good material in there. Um, so it, it looks pretty solid. I ARJS, I'm only mentioning, I'm not sure how active that is, but it was the only dedicated AR project I was aware of. I know A-Frame has kind of some AR capabilities, but I was looking for an open source AR web XR thing. And I didn't really find anything super obvious. Um, I don't have a use case for it, but I was just trying notionally to, you know, kind of figure it out. Um, and then there's a lot, like, like Elliot was mentioning, you know, think this being such a growth space that things are popping in and out of existence at a rapid pace. Um, obviously, utterances of the word meta, metaverse and spending of billions of dollars on things are gonna create enthusiasm. So uh, expect lots of change. Uh, it, does it, is there anyone here who has any specific knowledge about uh, other really good open source or free frameworks that, that would fall that I've over that I've overlooked? Um, or other like Un Unity and Unreal and Godot are pretty obvious. Are there any other like the web engine thing I thought was kind of cool. I didn't play with it yet, but anyone have a thing that no? Nothing, nothing super obvious that I missed. Okay, well, I guess that's good. Is that a thing? Well, play Canvas, but yeah, I actually asked in chat whether anybody had any news that like the whole meta announcement might have generated about support for um, WebGL in general or WebXR, but I guess that was a no. <laughs> But yeah, check out Play Canvas. It's Play Canvas, huh? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, oh, hey, look at this. Got uh, Wonder Wonderland Engine uh, dot com has a review of five WebXR frameworks. Oh, okay. kind of roll through everything that you've spoken about and Play Canvas. Oh, okay. Uh, and then they talk about kind of what sets them apart from those. So that's a cool resource. I'll, I'll make sure to take a look at that. Thanks, Elliot. Yep. Uh, so I clearly didn't even ever look at this slide since it's uh, basically three slides jammed together. Um, okay, so there's some third party tools that I did want to call out. Uh, the, these these guys they're doing some XR XR foundations making a lot of uh, very metaversey NFT crypto uh, things uh, but this uh, this universal volumetric um, project was uh, a volumetric video viewer I think which looked pretty cool uh, oh someone called this out Spectre.BabylonJS this is good for viewing, uh, looking at your web VR app and like inspecting at the, at the GL, web, uh, GLSL or like kind of looking at kind of the core um, details about the rendering. Um, so it provides not just a simple inspector that just shows you the objects, but kind of gives you information about, you know, what's being sent to the GPU and things like that. So this might be useful for debugging specific problems. Um, and this is a tool that's built by the Babylon JS people. And this is, the, there's an option installed as a, a browser plugin, or you can embed it directly into your app and launch it that way. 
Uh, oh, this was something else that I thought was super cool. PWA on Oculus. So Oculus recently, just in the last uh, few weeks, month, maybe. Yeah, so no, no, from it was late October. They added the ability to bundle. Uh, I, I don't actually fully understand exactly what the technology was, what, what it was they added, but you can implement a web app, a WebXR web app, bundle it in an APK and deliver it that way. So you can make it a deliverable instead of being something that's delivered over a browser, right? You can make it an installable application. So you can use 3JS to make a web application, bundle that as if it were an application and then distribute that. So that could be a, an option if you really didn't want people to have access to the source and that sort of thing. Um, and then I did want to mention Ammo and Canon JS, which are uh, physics libraries. I know A-Frame has a, a, like A-Frame physics component that wraps these or something that, you know, allows you to have interact, you know, you have multiple objects, now you need to track collisions and, you know, you know, you want to make one a projectile. So you have to calculate the, the arc that that would travel through and, you know, those, those sorts of things. So when you want, you want objects to interact with each other. Um, so ammo and cannon, I'm sure there's other things. This, these are the, these are the kind of spaces where there's probably going to be a lot of, a lot of development there. And then that's it. That's, uh, that's the extent of, we can go through some demos. I've got a big long list of bookmarks that, uh, that I've, uh, kind of collected if people want to see examples, but this, this concludes the presentation part. Maybe I'll just ask your opinion, Austin, or maybe Dennis has an idea. It, you know, it strikes me that Unity and Unreal have such a tremendous amount of assets and such an enormous head start that they've kind of, if you're really doing um, immersive, kind of game style, you know, a, a drawn reality kind of thing, that it would be hard for anyone to catch up with those guys. Yeah, I, so I, I agree with that. There was a long discussion about this, and uh, I know we were trying to avoid the word, um, but metaverse and, and what the metaverse is foundationally. Um, I heard some really, really great insight from a uh, from a professor who said, uh, and this is at Augmented World Expo, he said, you know, at its core, the metaverse is a app store. And I was like, no, 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 at first. And I was so dissatisfied with that summary of it. But the more you think about it, until we have something that resides outside of the app store, it's exactly what it is, right? It gets a, like, it's the first thing that you see when you put on the headset. And that's being managed by somebody. So I'm surprised right now, um, Elliot, that somebody hasn't made a move for Unreal and somebody hasn't made a move for Unity. Because once you own all those assets and have that head start, it's, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to take a long time. But the internet has a way of kind of screwing up business people's plans. So there's quite a bit of sensor fusion technology that will be appearing. So those assets that were previously impossible or difficult to create that, that process will be democratized. So if you want the rocks, so for instance, Unreal paid for Quixel in their, in their massive, massive real world library. Well, those were people curating, creating all those rocks from places that they were going all around the world. Once you open source the ability to create that geometry and you have the processing power on hand to optimize it and upload it somewhere open source, that, that previous library of assets is kind of moot. So you're right, there is a head start, but open source and the internet as kind of a consortium of people is kind of like unlimited. So that's your, that's your potential like seesaw. Like it's gonna go very, very corporate in the beginning and then probably seesaw in, in the other direction is my, is, is my guess, is my hope. I, just, I, I did a lot of work with game developers, not, in recent times, but over maybe a 10, 15 year window. And you know, what, what I saw was game development teams of about 10 developers, and that was the whole game team, transform into teams of a hundred 
where it was still 10 guys coding and 90 artists, uh -huh. right? And, and the focus of those teams to make artists productive uh -huh. over years, that strikes me as something that even, you know, with the, the breadth and the wisdom of the internet becomes challenging because they've got internet savvy business models, right? Yeah. They'll, you know, you can get Unreal for free. They just want a cut of the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree. I think I think the other thing to think about as well is um, I've seen some some work uh, from some folks out in New Zealand that are using AI for creating new textures and new models. Um, and Lori, I'm sure that you've seen this as well. Like synthetically generated content is a thing. I mean, it's a, it's already starting to become a thing. So that's that's potentially another path as well. I so I'm Elliot, we, sorry i was gonna say Elliot, your suggestion that they have such a head start that makes me think i'm totally missing something about unreal right like i'm pretty sure they're building to the web in completely spectacular ways that i just don't perceive or i'm not aware of or like i well i've, I've certainly seen plenty of content in oculus that is authored on the unreal engine so oh, whether yeah. or not they they target web assembly or they just they did Oculus. I mean, you know, I the the opportunity, and I know if I look on the website, I see they've got WebXR splashed all over it. Yeah. Um, that to me seems like that's the kind of stuff that's easy for them to do, versus content authoring tools, a world of people skilled in it. You know, those are some of the assets that that ecosystem piece that get hard to replicate. And I think Unity's got the same thing. Yeah. We also have tremendous access to money. I think yeah. Tencent acquired a big chunk of them for tens of billions of dollars. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot there. Assets like Fortnite, I mean, holy cow. Right. Oh, I see. That's yeah, even outside of art assets, but just tech, tech and yeah, uh, and applications. Yeah. There's there's a there's a there's a lot there. So, you know, it's it, it's interesting. And and when I was looking at the, the Unreal business model, right? If you want to do something free and open, the tools are free. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? That's, you know. Yeah. The, the other way I think about it as well is AOL circa 1994, 1995. Right. For most people, that was the internet for a good chunk of time, and it wasn't until you had some standardization around HTML and actually some some examples and, I, and I, I love this about what austin was doing is that it was working off examples because that's what we should be looking at um one of the things again that also came out of awe was we don't have yet an example of hyperlinking in the metaverse or in the whatever we're going to call it in the X, xr verse you know how to hyperlink from one application to a certain place xyz and time in another application that that doesn't exist right now and it's incredibly frustrating that it doesn't and until we get that or some server that supports it, we're kind of locked in each of these things, having to quit them, go back out to whatever home space somebody's created for you and then jump back in. There's no yeah. there's no hyperlinking the way we expect it to be, like as far as the web is concerned. Right. And those those sort of higher level standards, I think, will be really important to creating a more um, consistent a world where we're not locked into walled gardens, mm -hmm. right? It's not, I'm in the game, I drop out, or in an environment, I drop out to a 2D space, I enter another environment, yeah. right? It's I could stay in, I could transport from 3D space to 3D space. Um, did you find, um, Austin, was there any technology that you saw? I saw, I saw that you, you called out hyperlinking, but in A-frame, if you wanted to call to one environment, in A-frame, are you immediately pulled out and that environment that you're in is destroyed? Is that how that works? Yeah, uh, so the flow, when you, you, okay, so there is a link element and you can follow a link, but it pops, when you do that, it pops out of the immersive web thing into the 
you know, the, say the Oculus home environment. Yeah. I've, only, I've only recently been using my Quest. And then you see the 2D browser window and then it does the link transition. And right. then you have to re-hit the immersive button. Right. So you didn't go laterally. You had to pop out and then pop back in. Right. And that's, it's funny because I'm like, it breaks immersion. Well, I mean, I'm still in, the, it's like, it's like Inception a little bit, right? Because you, I'm still in an immersive environment. It's just mm -hmm. like, there's no smooth transition. And there, there has been discussion. So I wrote a blog post, uh, you know, about a month ago about this. And like, I, I got some people managed to see it. So they have been talking about it. And I mean, the, there's a W3C committee who's working on this particular navigation group, immersive web navigation group. And they've been discussing this for years. And uh, um, they're, 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 they, they have a proposal I've not, actually managed to find specifically what the proposal is. I don't know, because it's like a spread across a bunch of GitHub issues. And it's not clear to me exactly what the proposal is, but I think it's going into a black space and then you transition to a black space and then you go back into the next thing. And I don't know, I've, I've tried to find the text of that and I'm not, I keep getting distracted with doing like presentations and implementation of things, but uh, yeah. That's I, that's an in interesting observation there, an interesting insight, right? Because we, when we think about load time now, it's a page that's loading. When we think about load time in immersive environments, there's nothing. Like there's literally nothing, right? So what does that intermediary space look like if it's not your home? Yeah. Your home space, your VR home or AR home space, whatever yeah. that is. Sorry, Laura, you had something to say a little bit ago. Do you recall what that is? Does it feel relevant anymore? I don't know. <laughs> you no. <laughs> I mean, it is kind of unfortunate, like this all I think ties back to like, where's the money being focused in the development of all of these technologies. Um, I asked earlier, and then someone else touched on it that they like, did this did Facebook with their meta announcement, you know, direct any kind of attention to the development of more support for web um this metaverse that they want to create um it needs to be in the browser and you know sure it there is an, a monetary incentive for these mega corporations to silo it off into their own worlds but but shouldn't you know they also lead the way with setting these standards so that everybody else can come come up to it and yeah, and it's it's kind of weird that like, you know, we know what to expect when we click a link on the web. Sure, there's sometimes load times, but it just pops you into whatever you expected you would get. Why isn't it just exactly that way in XR? Yeah. Um, it, it's weird. It's almost like we're like in the 80s with- We are. <laughs> with, the thing, yeah. with the thing that's supposed to be the future, the, you know, the holodeck, We've never, we haven't gotten there yet. So that's that's where that's where I think now is a unique time because we do have this this new thing going on where users are tolerant of less polished and have like take Gorilla Tag for example it's a popular game it is not very fancy right it's like that it's, it's a really popular game on the quest and it has lots and lots of networked users. And so I feel like there's a reset in people's willingness to accept certain content, right? People are willing to play, and this has always been true. People have been willing to play games that aren't AAA games. Um, but I, I think this new technology let, lets people get their toes in the, in the door and, and can possibly, you know, pose a threat to Unreal and in Unity and all of the existing players because because people's expectations are completely different in this arena than they are in other, like a PS5 game, you would never, you know, uh, there's a small, you know, there's a lot of indie community and that, that, that's actually a pretty big market, but I think it. I think we're, we're, we're th this space is gonna end up being much bigger than, um, you know, this kind of authored content, I think, you know, the opportunities for, for video, for sports, uh, for theater, I mean, it, 
this whole retail yeah right medicine there. education yep so th there's a it's a big big space yeah 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 and and, and these are growing pains I, I think for anybody watching this later that goes like oh my god what like why would you even try because you got to start somewhere and like it's you know if you don't like if you don't get your toes wet if you don't mess with the examples if you don't try to build your own stuff you know yeah it's not going to be as clean and easy potentially as css and html5 yet but it's it's a start and it's going to get you somewhere and without that iteration we don't go anywhere um you know it, it's a pain i will say that we're working on an application on my side where we're stuck inside the in unity and canvas and it's like why are we having to do things where there are specifications for pixel perfect positioning in html and css why does css not why is that not natively supported in the unity engine right things that we've already solved for um and so we're we're going back and forth which is like this is why i make the the the, the the uh, analogy to flash it's kind of the growing pains that we have until the thing pops up and it's like oh finally we can just build this whole freaking thing using web standards i had a quick question maybe for dennis and uh and laurie so we're a unity shop and um interested in webgl or well we do a lot of webgl but web xr and about a year ago i tried to export a unity project to uh, web xr and tried uh a couple of different export uh, engines. And uh, the Mozilla one's not really supported and had issues with uh, rendering quality. Uh, the DePanther one had beautiful quality, but didn't seem to support, at least at the time, uh, kind of fall back to the browser. So I was wondering what you guys were doing with regard to building WebXR using Unity. I have avoided it like a plague. <laughs> like it's just... Yeah, I'm in a similar position. We are we fell back to just WebGL. We're we're aiming for the browser, knowing that when when a, when WebXR catches up, like WebGL is the like lowest common denominator target. That means that porting to WebXR when it becomes available will be theoretically for in our strategic business decisions that will be an easy target to map, meet when it when it's ready, but it's not ready. It's yeah. sad because we need VR on the web. It's, you know, the web is the most accessible target uh, as a platform. So um, for VR to get any kind of adoption, it needs to be accessible on the web. And I'm just disappointed that we're still here in 2021. <laughs> wishing for it to get as good as it can be and depending on just a few like it's cool that mozilla is on this but you know all these big players ought to be also on setting the standards yeah i'm concerned that mozilla's recent restructuring has yeah. impacted their yeah that they they stopped supporting their unity web xr exporter about two years ago mm -hmm. yeah. and they killed off hubs right didn't they kill off support no, no, no. Now? I don't know the answer to that I think they're keeping hubs I think hubs was one of the things I kept but they haven't so the thing I've noticed is the the reality browser is still from December 2020 hmm. the, that's the latest release but they they said like one of the guys is on uh, I was uh, on uh, one of these discords and he said you know we're we're working on it and I looked at these they, their issues open they're still coding he's like but there's not going to be a release for a while so um, Evan, I don't know if you caught the beginning of Austin's presentation, but he brought up browser compatibility and kind of the big pain that that is right now. And just like where it was iterative, it kind of has stopped and you, you know, kind of, there's like this kind of wishy-washy implementation of stuff. And like you just said, Austin, um, you know, seeing a browser not be updated for nearly 11 months is a little disconcerting a lot disconcerting if, if you're going to if you're going to be doing business in the browser yeah yeah i mean personally i've kind of given up on the idea of having a browser fallback mm -hmm. and i'd just be happy if it worked in uh you know in xr and uh, again i mean I, it's been a while since i've dabbled in this but i mean i took kind of a you know pretty complicated unity 3d project 
you know, an XR project and ported it to WebXR. And it, it runs on a tethered headset, uh, you know, Rift S. Um, and, and it runs, um, it runs natively on a Quest. So I, I congrats think, for, for doing that. Yeah. So, I mean, I think if you can, if you can aim for desktop, then you've got you just, Unity and Unreal are both still viable options for um, VR. But yeah, well, no, no. What I meant was, um, it's a WebXR product, a WebXR yeah. deployment. But you know, you can launch Firefox and hit the XR, you know, the the XR button and the VR button, and it'll launch in a tethered headset, and it'll it'll run in a the uh, Quest Two. I haven't tried it in a, in a, in a Quest One. So I mean, I think that's at least something, um, you know. And it has the advantages, obviously, of a WebGL. You don't have to do an installation. You can update it instantly. You know, the usual stuff. So um, I was just curious if you guys were pursuing that in any way. I, I I'm kind of a little undecided. It's kind of a business decision. You know, how do you want to monetize your app? Um, for the WebGL stuff, we're using subscriptions. So this kind of would be a perfect analogy. Um, but, you know, you can always sell something as an app and then, you know, WebGL is kind of doesn't really fit there. I mean, that's the other advantage of working in Unity is just you can deploy to anything, you know, you know whereas, um, you know, you mentioned Austin that you could create an A-frame project and wrap it in something uh, and deploy it as an app. It reminds me of the I can't remember the the uh, the systems that you could where you could wrap a JavaScript application as an app. But yeah, Electron. You know, the Electron was one of them. But typically, you don't have all the other stuff that you'd like in your development environment, like analytics and and app purchases and so on. So yeah. Unity is obviously great in that regard. Austin, thank you for the presentation. I mean, we can keep talking, but I, I just wanted to call out like it's it's a lot of work to set up the presentation and make sure that we're all here. And I really appreciate the effort. And if if anyone else wants to give a presentation about the work that we're that you know that, that you're doing, we're all ears. We're we're open to facilitating and hosting that. Um, our audience is around 380, 390 folks that get the email about these uh, these events. Uh, we used to do them in person uh, every month, like I said, for almost four years straight uh, in the Tempe, air, you know, Phoenix area. Um, we've gone digital, but not fully immersive yet. And I know that we've even talked about doing that. So we might want to think about hosting something either on Altspace or some, some communal server somewhere. Uh, Austin, I know that you at one point talked about potentially, you know, talking, you know, talked about putting together maybe like a hub place that we could meet or something to that effect. That would be really interesting early on. Um, but we're all ears and, you know, I'm, 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 I simply see myself as a person to facilitate connections and information exchange. So thank you again, Austin. This has been you tremendous. Bet. Yeah. And we can keep talking. I just wanted to say thank you because, because that effort is appreciated. Oh yeah. I want to reiterate that and Kevin here too. <laughs> Thank you. Should I should I stop recording at this point? Call this the official end of the recording, maybe? Yeah, and we can chit chat. All right. I'm going to 